All right, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Brad Kearns. I'm going to bring a chair in case I... Oh, so high tech. I can hear myself. Saturday morning is time for rhythmic clapping, please, everybody. <laughs> Louder, come on. Nice, okay. Now when I say, give me three, you clap three times quickly like this. When I say, give me two, you clap twice, right? Got it? Give me three. Give me two. Give me one. Give me three. Give me two. Give me one. That's my son's basketball coach, Coach Dave, coaching a bunch of eighth graders. And they'd show up at the gym, and they'd be all rowdy and crazy. And he'd get them doing a little clapping, and they were totally focused. So now we're focused. And now all rise, please. And we're going to take a deep breath, raising our hands over our head like this. Inhale, and then when you re exhale, you just relax and let your hands drop. Inhale. Exhale. OK, so when we take deep diaphragmatic breaths, you can sit down now. Maybe one more, you're sneaking it in. That's fair. So we take these deep diaphragmatic breaths, we activate the parasympathetic nervous system, right? We're in a relaxed rest and digest state as opposed to that sympathetic nervous system activation when we're breathing shallow panting breaths. So when you're taking deep diaphragmatic breaths, you're physically incapable of being stressed. That's why breath is so important. It's such a fundamental part of yoga. So you can control your breath and you can control your, your stress and your stress reaction. So now we're focused and we're relaxed, right? And we're getting to learn about uh, ketones. Let's see. Ketone production happens in the liver under circumstances of low dietary carbohydrate intake. Interestingly, a single liver hormone known as FGF21 is responsible for the... Oh, it's, it's the wrong presentation. Okay. <laughs> it's called Get Over Yourself. Wow. What a, what a title, right? Um, this is the age of the guru, it's the age of social media and trying to get, grab attention to what you're doing and spread it out to the world. And sometimes to me, it gets to be a little too much. And I feel like we have this mentality as we pursue success that we think we have to obsess over all the results and struggle and suffer to generate results. And that's why I want to title this presentation. I think it was titled something else in the book, right? Success Mindset or something boring. So we're going to go with get over yourself. Um, and uh, I'm a, uh, my perspective is coming from, uh, from, from being an athlete my whole life. And back when I was younger, I was a professional uh, competitor in the sport of triathlon, swimming, biking, and running. Uh, I competed on the international circuit for nine years. And it was a great journey. It was always what I wanted to do when I was a little kid was be an athlete. And I got to live this dream out and travel all over the world. And at my best, I did very well. I was national champion. I was ranked number three in the world when the picture was taken. And um, I also got my butt kicked a lot. And I, I had to process failure and learn these lessons of life and success and failure in the most intense and dramatic fashion possible. I mean, there I am running around in my underwear, and when you get your butt kicked, everyone's watching you run in your underwear and get your butt kicked, and then you gotta go home with your tail between your legs, because an athlete can really develop an ego and a sense of self-importance that everything's riding on the result of your race, and you have to go through and process that and get over yourself. So that's kind of the, the reference point that I like to share, and the most important thing, the most uh, important thing I have to, to share in a one-liner that I learned from my time uh, as, as an athlete was that results happen naturally when your motivation is pure. And what I mean by that with a pure motivation is that you're doing something for the pure joy of the pursuit of the activity, the appreciation of the process, and you are not attaching your self-esteem to the results. Because when you 
attach your self-esteem to results and get into that obsessive struggle and suffer mentality, that's when you get pulled away from your center of power and your center of good decision-making and patience and resilience and all those things that you need to succeed, especially as an athlete. But feel free to draw some analogies to whatever your goals are. And we're talking about health here. A lot of people are interested in weight loss and improving their health and changing their diet. And all these same things go into play. So my uh, best uh, example of a pure motivation takes you back all the way to the start of when I started this crazy triathlon stuff. And I was at UC Santa Barbara, greatest campus in the world, enjoying life. Everybody's walking around shorts and a t-shirt and you ride your bike all over the place. And I was just getting into triathlon and enjoying this new sport, having been injured and sick and devastated and disappointed trying to be a division one college athlete and having it not work out. But now I'd get on my bike and I'd ride all around the mountains surrounding Santa Barbara and I'd go in the ocean and practice my swimming and be at one with nature. And oh, it was such a wonderful time. There was surfing, there was fun things to do all the time. Sometimes you'd go to class if there was nothing fun to do. Um, and then uh, a great tragedy occurred in my life around that time. Graduation. <laughs> and I was all of a sudden, you know, teleported into a suit and tie, driving an hour in Los Angeles, rush hour traffic each way to my job in a high rise downtown as a staff auditor at the world's largest accounting firm. Um, and no offense to that career track and the guys I was working with loved it and it was so exciting to have this brand new career, but it wasn't my dream. Someone threw me into the wrong dream and I wanted to go back to campus and ride my bike around and go surfing and, and try this fun sport of triathlon. That's what I was all about at that time. So I lasted a long time at the firm. I lasted 11 and a half weeks and then uh, I met with my, my supervisor and I announced that I was retiring from the firm to pursue a career as a professional triathlete. And he went, <laughs> oh, good luck with that. And he was right because back then, this is many years ago, um, there wasn't really the opportunity to make an income like there is today. Triathlon's a big sport, it's in the Olympics now. But back then there was a few top guys and they were the legends of the sport. Um, some of you that have been in the sport know these guys, the big four, and they took all the money and all the glory. And then there was a bunch of people chasing them. So I wanted to be one of those guys that was chasing them. But when I exited that office building for the last time, I felt this incredible sense of freedom. And I got out onto the street and I looked up in the sky and I thought, you know, now the world's mine. I have this compelling goal. The very next day I got on my bike and rode 103 miles. And this was after a winter of auditing books of savings and loans. So I was not quite in shape to do that, but I didn't care. I just kept pedaling those legs all over Southern California. And I got to the finish line. I could barely walk, but I was just so full of that pure motivation and that joy to push myself and challenge myself as a triathlete. So I'd go to these races and race against the big guys and I'd get 24th and 21st and 17th and 19th and then I'd go to a small race where there was nobody important and I'd get fourth or something cool. Um, but I didn't care because everything was, you know, my success was self-referred. I was always judging only against myself. I didn't have any pressure or expectations placed on me by others because no one cared about me. It was easy to get over myself under those circumstances, right? But there was always something positive and there was always something to, to gleam on that I, I felt like I was improving. So even though I had no chance of making money and I was well behind these guys, I kept improving slowly but surely. And my training was very uh, successful, very effective because there was no technology back then. There were no coaches. There were no people measuring and judging what I was doing. I'd just wake up and I'd do what I felt like. So if it was a nice day to bike, I'd go bike. And if I wanted to swim, I'd go swim. And if I was tired, I'd go back home and rest. And all these things were actually representing the highest level of sophistication as an athlete. But I didn't realize it because I was just stumbling along as a young kid. But what happened was I went to the, 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 the final race of the season and it was this big showdown against the two top guys in the world who had never faced each other and everyone was wondering who was going to win with this incredible showdown. And the winner was this uh, rookie professional triathlete from Los Angeles, totally unknown. And I had the race of my life and I beat everybody. And it was a big shock to me and everybody else. You know, you cross the finish line and the media comes at you and they're like, did you do the entire course? Because there was another, uh, yeah? I'm like, yeah, it was me. Um, but anyway, 
when I crossed that finish line, that's when everything changed, right? It was a wonderful experience. It was all my dreams come true. But then I started to become a prominent person in the sport. I realized I could actually have a career with this. I realized that now it was time to get focused and serious and not be so loosey-goosey with my training. And I should write down everything and time everything and measure and judge how I was doing to make sure that I could keep my status because now I had a target on my back. And can you imagine what happened? after I started to change my approach. I started to get my butt kicked because all of a sudden I was full of myself. Everything was too important, too serious. I had lost all those magical uh, attributes of having a pure motivation. So I had to recalibrate, I had to continue. You get your butt kicked a few times, you have a tendency to recalibrate and, and kind of question your approach. And so that's what I did. I had to junk all this self-important stuff, go back to what got me to that success in the first place, which was the pure love of the outdoors and the activity, and making the right decisions and doing the right things for my body. So again, we have an analogy to health goals, dietary goals, where if you're doing things because you actually enjoy the meals, you enjoy the process of cooking, you enjoy walking down to the farmer's market with your backpack and selecting foods and going home and preparing them, rather than going up to the drive through and buying some junk food, all these kind of things are going to be the real factors that support that pure motivation. Um, big difference from getting caught up into the, uh, the importance of what you're doing, right? So if we're going to make some three tips to, to take home to cultivate that pure motivation and get over yourself, number one, getting over yourself, releasing your attachment to the outcome of what you're doing and just enjoying and appreciating the process without getting caught up. So again, if it's a weight loss goal, the weight loss comes as a byproduct of making healthy dietary habits. Oh, so is that my countdown or count up? I've only been talking for seven minutes. Can you believe that? Oh, it's countdown. I see. Okay, that's cool. Um, number two, I mentioned this quickly while I was talking, is to choose a positive attitude. It's always a choice, our attitude, right? So even when I was getting my butt kicked, and people would scoff at me when I would write letters to try to get a sponsor for free sunglasses or something. Um, you know, th there's always a way to think, well, at, at least I'm improving, at least I'm enjoying myself, and I have something to shoot for. I, I can create a positive experience here, even when it's seemingly negative because you didn't reach your measured goal. So you always have the choice uh, to, to select a positive attitude. You know who taught me this really powerfully? Since I'm in Austin, I should mention it because I learned it here. Lance Armstrong. So, Lance has a lot of great attributes for success. He was a great champion, then he got disgraced with all the doping. But he taught me something that I'll never forget. And this was back when he was on top. He was the big guy in the world, winning the Tour de France. And my company sponsored him, so I'd get him to like sign a bunch of crap every time I saw him. He'd see me coming, coming at him when we had these gatherings. And he'd be like, what do you got now? Well, I have a stack of posters, some shirts, some hats. And so he was signing these posters here in Austin. It was in May at his cancer gathering called Ride for the Roses. And he started to go into a sneeze attack, because I guess in May, like, Austin's the allergy capital of the world, right? I mean, it's really bad, apparently. And I'd got there, and I was trying to run around the town lake, and I couldn't breathe because of all the allergies. So he starts sneezing nonstop, choo, 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 and I'm covering the posters to make sure they don't get covered with spit. And I say, wow, man, you know, this allergy thing is the real deal. I can't believe you suffer so bad. I could barely run today. My, arm, my, my lungs were like tightening up on me this morning. And look at you. And he's sneezing and he finishes sneezing. He's back to sign the posters. And I'm still complaining about the weather. And he looks up and he looks me right in the eye and he goes, quit bitching. <laughs> and he goes back to sign him. And I laughed like a nervous laugh, just like you did with that. <laughs> pop him on the shoulder because I'm cool and everyone's watching because everything Lance does, people are watching and who's this idiot with all the posters that he's signing for. Um, but I realized, you know, this was the gathering of the cancer survivors for his foundation with the yellow, people with the yellow bands. So it's a gathering of cancer survivors and I'm bitching and moaning about the weather in Austin. And I thought, you know, there's people like in hospital rooms that are always 72 degrees and they can look out the window and go, wow, it's 110 today, but they don't even get to experience weather. So how dare I complain about the weather? And I've never complained about the weather, you know, ever since that, that moment, that interaction where someone told me to quit bitching about the weather in a very serious tone but you know, you had to go process it later that night. So at the time I laughed nervously and then I thought about it later that night. So that's choosing a positive attitude at all times, no matter what, even if it's uh, flooding, like the people in my hotel who are pushed out of their, their homes in Houston and they're smiling on the elevator with their dog and their kids. 
positive attitude. And then finally, um, since we're, we gotta have some theme related to the KetoCon, right? 357, 356, 355. This is about how fast the world's top milers run a mile. How exciting. Yeah. Um, finally, it's balance your life, peoples. I mean, we can't be in, in these success positions and this pure motivation if we're living unbalanced life. So we've got to get the diet thing handled. I think we have some good, <laughs> good presenters on that note to, uh, here in this weekend's conference. Got to get the exercise thing handled, not, not over-exercising like I was guilty of when I'd, when I'd struggle and suffer, right, when I talked about. It was basically the mistakes I made that I needed to get over myself was overtraining because I pushed myself too hard, because I wanted to win so bad, because it was so important to win, so I'd push myself beyond what my intuition really told me I should do. So train and exercise in an intuitive manner. Don't push yourself too hard. And when you're feeling restless, like you haven't been moving much in, enough in your life, get out there and move more, because we have all these sedentary forces pushing us into sedentary patterns, and it's extremely unhealthy. Um, finally, the sleep is my big one. I'm a big champion of that. I think we have some presentations touching on that here and there. But when it gets dark, the goal is to minimize artificial light and digital stimulation after dark. Uh, you know, the primal, the paleo message, honoring the, the patterns of our ancestors. Um, when it got dark, we got sleepy and we went to sleep. So now as soon as we flip lights on, as soon as we flip a screen into, screen into our face, we mess with that hormone, the melatonin onset that helps us get sleepy and, and have a nice night of sleep. So if you're not sleeping enough, you should forget about all your other goals and your dietary patterns and your, which process you're gonna choose from Leanne's three choices. Just go to sleep more, okay? And then finally, stress management. There's a lot of ways and a lot of things to talk about here, but just taking a break from your busy life and that hectic stimulation of life, that's why we started clapping at the start, because everyone had to put their phone down to make two hands to clap, right? So if we're balancing our lives, choosing a positive attitude, and releasing your attachment to the outcome, we get to get over ourselves. Oh, push the thing, so at least I could say I had more than one slide. Or do I get to do that? I might push the wrong button. That's our book coming out in October, Mark Sisson and I. So I hope you um, go pre-order it right now. There's a bunch of bonus items. See, I had to plug something. And this is a great book. It's going to take you from start to finish to how to go keto the right way. Oh, I was going to try to finish right when you kicked me off. But how about a question or a comment? Anyone challenge what I have to say and think I'm wrong? That would be fun, right? Want to do some more clapping? Yeah, more clapping. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be here. Nice job, Brian. You're doing a great conference, your whole staff, too. Especially this thing. I'm going to keep this on like Leslie Nielsen. You see Naked Gun when he walked off stage and went to the bathroom? That was... All right. Thanks a lot for having me. Good luck with everything. <laughs>